Good morning. I'm David Julin. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Cramerton. Welcome to this is our sermon for uh, this coming Sunday. And I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to hear the words that you would have us to hear. Help us to obey where you have called us to obey and to have an abundant life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, this Sunday we are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper, as we Baptists call that. Now, the Lord's Supper comes in several, several different terms, at least three. One, you might hear about communion. And communion, I think, celebrates the idea of fellowship. You've heard possibly of a commune, which may not be the image that we're trying to convey, but it is people gathering together in fellowship together. The next is often, it's called the Eucharist. Now that's a Greek word that means thanksgiving, well offered, the Eucharist, thanksgiving. So we have communion, we have fellowship, we have thanksgiving, and then the term most often used by, uh, at least by in Baptist circles, is the Lord's Supper, which comes from the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But today our text comes from Matthew Matthew chapter 26, chapter 26, starting with verse 26. This is the night before Jesus uh, was going to uh, the cross. He's gathered with the disciples, and while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine now or until the day when I drink new in your Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. As I reflected on these words, what really struck me was the, the radicalness of this we, we overlook. The radicalness of Jesus changing the wording of the Passover meal that had been used hundreds, for hundreds of times, thousands of times over the last few centuries. Jesus is introducing new language. You can almost imagine, I, I just imagine, the disciples, they're going along with that, and all of a sudden Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. And they kind of go, what did he say? Is my body broken for you? This is my blood. Did he say the new covenant? And you know, and I wonder if they're kind of looking around and thinking, what is he saying? Jesus here is stepping into the role, I believe, of God. Stepping into the role and saying, this is a transformed memorial, and it's going to be reflecting of me and my death. This is my blood. This is my body. I think of the impact that would have had. Now, I'm sure they did not understand all that was going on at that point, but you know, that's how it is a lot in life. We don't always understand everything at the time it's going on. But can you imagine the impact for Jesus as he broke the bread? It would have been a loaf. It would have been a sort of a flat loaf, unleavened. And when he broke it and said, this is my body, knowing that his body is going to be broken within a day's time. I think it's a powerful image. I think that the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper, it's a, and the Lord's Supper is a radical restatement of what God's people had been celebrating for many years. But it is a continuation of the fact that they are united by faith. If you go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 12, back there where Moses is out at the mountain and he comes down and he tells them about how they are to celebrate the Passover. And he says a couple of interesting things. He says, the, first of all, he says the foreigners 
and the slaves, they are not to be included. But then he says, unless they are circumcised. Unless they understand what they are doing and are willing to be part of the faithful people. Now we say, oh, well, that was kind of nice. That is radical. That the, gen, that the ethnic groups of slavery and the tribe are all minimized over faith. Faith in Yahweh. Faith in the Lord God. The largest, most significant barriers in the ancient world are removed because of faith. There is a new community that is birthed out of this act and their primary identity is faith in the Yahweh Lord. It transcends all other means of identification. This, of course, is extended into the New Testament. Paul says in Galatians, In Christ there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, uh, Jew nor Gentile. The most significant means of identity in the world at that time are negligible when it comes to faith, are really removed. In fact, their primary identity becomes as Christians, people of faith. You know, and that's something we need to be mindful of. We are tied to a local church and a universal church. We are Christians. We are part of a community. Of course, we're also part of the human community. We're part of mankind. And part of living in this world is God has given us minds and bodies. We are mind-body combinations. And we survive by taking in information and images and all the things that we bring into our lives in order to be, uh, to be people who are flourishing or even simply surviving. Our senses bring in information and experience to our brains and our bodies. We take in words that are going to inform us, persuade us, teach us, sometimes comfort us. But also this taking in of the world, this taking in of the world also brings in things that mar and distort the people that God wants us to be. We're constantly bringing in things that hurt and wound and denigrate and shame, images and words. We're treated a certain way. We treat people a certain way. We argue, we rage, and we are, and we are raged at. We receive sometimes love, sometimes hate. You don't have to go far in this world where you have images of violence pornographic images, abusive images, demeaning and mocking images, images that say that uh, how we look and how we act are not good enough. Maybe we've even had words and images coming in from people that love us that say we're no good, we should be ashamed, we're not uh, people who are worth, or we're not people of any value. You see, words and things we bring in sometimes shake us for good, shape us for good and sometimes for ill. Sometimes these images make us feel poorly and envy other people. I heard the other day where these ball players, I can't remember if it's college or foot or pro, but they receive death threats because of dropping a ball or missing a tackle. That's the kind of world that, that we live in. That, that's the kind of things that we take in, that our children take in, that people around us take in. So the image that comes to my mind that we need to think about is when do we begin to intentionally take in that which is not something that tears us down, something that is a poor image I think that the Lord's Supper can be part of that. The Lord's Supper can be part of that. We take in the, the blood and the body, and what that really means is that we acknowledge Jesus' love and His sacrifice for us. We are acknowledging that we, He knows us and He loves us, and 
that's a love that can cast out fear, that you know, when we're afraid, we're reminded that Jesus loves us. Not because of what we've done, not because of where we're from, but because of His love and His grace and His mercy. Now, sometimes I'm sure it seems so far away. It's felt that so far in my life sometimes. But the Lord's Supper, if we allow it to be, you know, I'm from the Baptist church and we don't, um, we don't believe and understand this to be the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. But I am convinced over the years that often in an effort to minimize what perhaps the Roman Catholics have believed, that we have really um, devalued some of the importance of the Lord's Supper. I think that's happened in my life and in my ministry, that this is what Jesus left us, along with baptism, in order to remember Him until He comes. So it is significant. It is significant. In the Lord's Supper, we acknowledge that His body, His blood, was die, that, that He died for us. And we are taking that in. We are taking that in to our lives. We are also saying that I believe He looks upon us with compassion. He has compassion upon us. And of course, we are to reflect that compassion to others. In the, in the Psalms it says, When a father has compassion on his children... So the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. Jeremiah said, Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. You know, the Hebrew word for compassion is the word they also have for womb. It comes out of the word for womb in this intimate understanding of the closeness of God for His children and the closeness that God we reaches out. So when we take the Lord's Supper, we're taking in God's compassion. And our resource is Jesus. We're taking in Jesus through our mind, through our, I hate to use sanctified imagination, and that means that it doesn't mean it's imaginary. It means, though, that we are visualizing this spiritual reality. We are visualizing a spiritual reality that Jesus uh, has left for us to remember, remember as often as you take this. You know, I've read this again, I don't know how many thousand times probably, but after the verse 30, uh, after the supper at verse 30, it says, they sang a hymn and went out onto the Mount of Olives. Now, I've always thought or even said, we don't know what that hymn was. But I realized this week through my study that in the normal occurrence at that time, at least they believed that quite often the Psalms from Psalm 114 to about 118 were sung as the benediction. And... Uh, there were certain parts that were sang, and um, and they were sang in a in a in a manner that they would sing, and and then another person would sing and sing, and another person would sing, and um, it just gives me comfort that Jesus would the night before his death, his body and his blood. He knows are going to be shed. And then he sings antiphonally back and forth, back and forth. And often they say the, the, the leader would do that, that I don't know what Jesus' voice was like. But in that moment, he sang. He sang praises to God. He sang praises to God the night before his death. Uh, of course, I don't know what scripture it was, but if we look at Psalm 116, Think about this. What if J Jesus sang, I love the Lord for He heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because He turned His ear to me, I will call on Him as long as I live. As long as I live. Listen, sometimes we sing 
to push back the night. We sing because we don't know what to say or what to believe. And I believe singing can give us a great sense of comfort. Jesus sang before he went to sacrifice himself for us. So let's remember what we're taking in when we bring in the Lord's Supper is the grace and the mercy of Jesus who became a man in order to die for us. But he was also God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those blessings you've given us. We ask now that you would help us to sing if we need to, maybe in our hearts and minds, when we don't understand, when we don't know what to do. Lord, help us to obey and to take your commandments, the baptism and also of the Lord's Supper. Help us to commune with others and commune with you and to give thanksgiving. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, listen, God bless you. I hope you will take the Lord's Supper wherever you worship. If you'd like to, come worship with us. God bless you, and I hope to see you soon.